because we tend to value, you know, say, artifacts in museums more than the people who made them, and the same is true here, yeah. Hmm. Hi. You can borrow this one. <laughs> Yes, um, before you're, you began, you started speaking, we saw a video of what looked to be um, a collection of grave rubbings that um, were being unwrapped and then put up on the wall. And I wondered if you would say a few words about them. Well, yeah, good. I thought yeah. no one was paying attention. Well, the beginning of it, you, you probably didn't see the very beginning, but the beginning showed that it's an installation. It showed the installation when it was completed, and the installation consists of, they're not grave rubbings, I'll tell you a bit more about them in a minute, but the installation consists of that wall of those um, images with a park bench in front of it and a, a, a tape recorder on the bench so that you can sit and listen through headphones to this, I now see as a very rambling uh, monologue by me about... <laughs> Um, death and representation and sitting in a park and ignoring things and so forth and so on. They are commemorative plaques that were made in the early 20th century to commemorate um, civilian heroes, that is, people who did heroic acts of rescuing other people and so forth. And they continued up until about the time of World War I, at which point, I guess, because there were so many heroes, dead heroes at that point, that they were commemorating military people after that rather than civilians in this way. And um, the, the, the irony in, in my collection of these plaques is that these people all were unsuccessful in their attempts to rescue anybody. They all died in the attempt. So this is kind of double meaning there. And the phrase, strive to be your own hero, was a graffiti in the park, or I think it's actually a graffito, but I keep, I've always called it a graffiti, I apologize for that, but it was someone had seen these rather melancholy and very brilliantly written little concise things commemorating each of these unsuccessful heroes. Uh, and obviously had been motivated to write up this, this slogan, you know, strive to be your own hero. But it occurred to me, and this was the basis of the piece, was the contradiction between that, uh, the graffiti and the bulk of the images. Actually, whoever wrote that up was caught in the same mindset because it's still about striving, it's still about heroism, heroism, and th there really isn't any contradiction. These people were striving to be their own hero too, you know, and it's anyway, it's kind of irony there. So that piece is a very early for me, it's a installation, multimedia installation from 1980. And I think that that was the first time that I used voice in a piece. And I think it's also quite an early installation of that kind, you know, that, that integrates different media together. The person sitting on the park bench becomes a very important part of the work. So when you come into the room, you see someone sitting on the bench listening, and that person is the real live person against this backdrop of representations of dead people. And that person is performing a private act of listening in public. So. That piece for me was a transition between earlier live works that I did and later works, and it was always a touchstone for me in this idea of um, creating a space for the viewer that's integral to the work, that the work doesn't really exist without a viewer. Thank you for noticing that video. I'm sorry it wasn't well focused. We're having a problem. <laughs> Challenges, yes, because the, all my work was made in England. It's a different video system. Yeah. 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 I have a question about your example about Rotterdam, which I find a problematical situation mm -hmm. in a way different than mm -hmm. your own interpretation of it, which is, what is the alternative? Either everybody could speak excellent 
English, or you could speak one of the languages of one of theirs, yeah. or none of, none of the participants could come together at all and speak at all and no, stay in their that. own countries and have a very... No, 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 no. Well, I'm not that bad. No, 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 no. I mean, no. But, no, but no. the reality but there is... is... A, there, is a, there is actually an alternative. Please. Um, this is going to make you laugh. What about Esperanto? <laughs> now, seriously, because it is possible to start with... It is possible to rebuild, to build a language out of, out of virtually nothing. Uh, let's say modern Hebrew grew from, you know, a, a very limited vocabulary into a perfectly good language. Welsh has been reinvented. You know, it but is they're possible reinvented. To grow, it is possible to grow a modern language on the basis of a few structural rules. But okay? you were talking about language reflecting a culture. Yeah, Esper Esperanto could never do that. Yeah, well, and in it, fact, Esperanto was largely based on Romance languages, yeah, which has right. nothing to do with Asian languages, African it's not, languages. At least it's not speaking English. <laughs> no, seriously, I, don't, I, I think it's possible. Why can't you create a world language? If that's what you want, it doesn't interfere with people's individual cultures and their languages. I, I mean, obviously, Esperanto did not prove to be a great success, right. although there are still people who, who are very involved in Esperanto. Um, it, 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 it came from the wrong starting point. I think we would need to start now with a much more a broader view of what elements you would take from different languages in order to make a new language. But I would, I would think that that would have a utopian element, which Esperanto did have, didn't yes, it? Yes, it did. The idea of a world of people communicating in Esperanto. I think it would have an, an idealistic and utopian position that English, a dominant language from a dominant culture, could never have. That's all. I mean, I know it's not possible. Mm. I'd like to see it. That's my we, answer. Well, just, That's my answer. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. All right. No. Thanks. Um, I was very interested in your work, and um, and in particular what you say uh, about truth to materials and revealing the original nature of materials. Um, and at the same time, you said that you don't share an interest in the fallacy of objectivity. So what I'm wondering is how you conceive of yourself in the work and in the inverse of, um, of what you've laid out, have you ever considered yourself as the material with which the thing you're working with is collaborating? Mm. Good question, and I would say yes. Um, <laughs> um, I think you know, there are, there are many really fabulous artists who work on themselves and with themselves in, almost entirely as subject matter. And, I, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with them. I've only ever made one piece in which I was the subject matter of the piece. Okay? Um, I think the works are very personal because I'm selecting these weird starting points because they, they, they fascinate me. You know, and, and I think they're very personal in the sense that I feel very committed to them and I feel that they set boundaries for me in terms of what I should be doing, really. You know, there, there's a lead in, in they're leading me in a particular kind of way. But that's as far as I can go. I can't probe this, this issue too much or I probably would never work again. Okay, thanks. Thank you.